Welcome back to the Buddhism YouTube channel, today we will continue reading The Sarlis Flower, written Gok Tran Dharma named Dien Phuc episodes number 13. 183. 48 Secondary or Lighter Precepts. 48 Secondary or Lighter Precepts which the Buddha taught all Bodhisattvas in the Brahmanet Sutra. First Secondary Precept on Disrespect Toward Teachers and Friends. A disciple of the Buddha who is destined to become an emperor, a wheel-turning king, or high official, should first receive the bodhisattva precepts. He will then be under the protection of all guardians, deities and spirits, and the Buddhas will be pleased. Once he has received the precepts, the disciple should develop a mind of filial piety and respect. Whenever he meets an elder master, a monk, or a fellow cultivator of like views and like conduct, he should rise and greet him with respect. He must then respectfully make offerings to the guest monks, in accord with the Dharma. He should be willing to pledge himself, his family, as well as his kingdom, cities, jewels and other possessions. If instead, he should develop conceit or arrogance, delusion or anger, refusing to rise and greet guest monks, and make offerings to them respectfully, in accordance with the Dharma, he commits a secondary offense. Second Secondary Precept on Consuming Alcoholic Beverages a disciple of the Buddha should not intentionally consume alcoholic beverages, as they are the source of countless offenses. If he but offers a glass of wine to another person, his retribution will be to have no hands for 500 lifetimes. How could he then consume liquor himself? Indeed, a bodhisattva should not encourage any person of any other sentient being to consume alcoholic, much less take any alcoholic beverages himself. A disciple should not drink any alcoholic beverages whatsoever. If instead, he deliberately does so or encourage others to do so, he commits a secondary offense. Third Secondary Precept on Eating Meat. A disciple of the Buddha must not deliberately eat meat. He should not eat the flesh of any sentient being. The meat eater forfeits the seed of great compassion, severs the seed of the Buddha nature, and causes animals and transcendental beings to avoid him. Those who do so are guilty of countless offenses. Therefore, bodhisattvas should not eat flesh of any sentient beings whatsoever. If instead, he deliberately eats meat, he commits a secondary offense. Fourth Secondary Precept on Five Pungent Herbs. A disciple of the Buddha should not eat the five pungent herbs. Garlic, chives, leeks, onions, and asafoetida. This is so even if they are added as flavoring to the main dishes. Hence, if he deliberately does so, he commits a secondary offense. Fifth Secondary Precept on Not Teaching Repentance. Should a disciple of the Buddha see any being violate the five precepts, the eight precepts, the ten precepts, other prohibitions, or commit any of the seven cardinal sins or any offense which leads to the eight adversities, any violations of the precepts whatever, he should counsel the offender to repent and reform. Hence, if a bodhisattva does not do so and furthermore continues to live together in the assembly with the offender, share in the offerings of the laity, participate in the same upasatha ceremony and recite the precepts, while failing to bring up that person's offense, enjoining himself to reprint, the disciple commits a secondary offense. Sixth Secondary Precept on Failing to Request the Dharma or Make Offerings. Should an elder master, a Mahayana monk or fellow cultivator of like views and practice, come from far away to the temple, residence, city or village of a disciple of the Buddha, the disciple should respectfully welcome him and see him off. He should minister to his needs at all times, though doing so may cost as much as three ounces of gold. Moreover, the disciple of the Buddha should respectfully request the guest master to preach the Dharma three times a day, by bowing to him without a single thought of resentment or weariness. He should be willing to sacrifice himself for the Dharma, and never be lax in requesting it. If he does not act in this manner, he commits a secondary offense. Seventh Secondary Precept on Failing to Attend Dharma Lectures. A disciple of the Buddha, who has just begun bodhisattva training, should take copies of the appropriate sutras or precept codes to any place where such sutras or moral codes are being explained, to listen, study, and inquire about the Dharma. He should go to wherever there is a Dharma master lecturing, be it in a house, beneath a tree, in a temple, in the forests or mountains, or elsewhere. If he fails to do so, he commits a secondary offense. Eighth Secondary Precept on Turning Away from a Mahayana. If a disciple of the Buddha denies the eternal Mahayana sutras and moral codes, declaring that they were not actually taught by the Buddha, and instead follows and observes those of the two vehicles and deluded externalists, he commits a secondary offense. Ninth Secondary Precept on Failure to Care for the Sick. Should a disciple of the Buddha see anyone who is sick, he is constantly to provide for that person's needs, just as he would for a Buddha. 
of the eight fields of blessings, looking after the sick is the most important. A Buddha's disciple should take care of his father, mother, dharma teacher or disciple, regardless of whether he or she is disabled or suffering from various kinds of diseases. If instead, he becomes angry and resentful and fails to do so, or refuses to rescue the sick or disabled in the temple, cities and towns, forests and mountains, or along the road, he commits a secondary offense. 10 Secondary Precept on Storing Deathly Weapons A disciple of the Buddha should not store weapons such as knives, clubs, bows, arrows, spears, axes or any other weapons, nor may he keep nets, traps or any such devices used in destroying life. As a disciple of the Buddha, he must not even avenge the death of his parents, let alone kill sentient beings. He should not store any weapons or devices that can be used to kill sentient beings. If he deliberately does so, he commits a secondary offense. 11 Secondary Precept on Serving as an Emissary A disciple of the Buddha shall not, out of personal benefit or evil intentions, act as a country emissary to foster military confrontation and war, causing the slaughter of countless ancient beings. As a disciple of the Buddha, he should not be involved in military affairs or serve as a courier between armies, much less act as a willing catalyst for war. If he deliberately does so, he commits a secondary offense. 12 Secondary Precept on Unlawful Business Undertakings A disciple of the Buddha must not deliberately trade in slaves or sell anyone into servitude, nor should he trade in domestic animals, coffins or wood for caskets. He cannot engage in these types of business himself, much less encourage others to do so. Otherwise, he commits a secondary offense. 13 Secondary Precept on Slander and Libel a disciple of the Buddha must not, without cause and with evil intentions, slander virtuous people, such as elder masters, monks or nuns, kings, princes or other upright persons, saying that they have committed the seven cardinal sins or broken the ten major bodhisattva precepts. He should be compassionate and filial and treat all virtuous people as if they were his father, mother, siblings or other close relatives. If instead, he slanders and harms them, he commits a secondary offense. 14 Secondary Precept on Starting Wildfire A disciple of the Buddha shall not, out of evil intentions, start wildfires to clear forests and burn vegetation on mountains and plains during the fourth to the ninth months of the lunar year. Such fires are particularly injurious to animals during that period and may spread to people's homes, towns and villages, temples and monasteries, fields and groves, as well as the unseen dwellings and possessions of deities and ghosts. He must not intentionally set fire to any place where there is life. If he deliberately does so, he commits a secondary offense. 15 Secondary Precept on Teaching Non-Mahayana Dharma A disciple of the Buddha must teach one and all, from fellow disciples, relatives and spiritual friends to externalists and evil beings, how to receive and observe the Mahayana Sutras and Moral Codes. He should teach the Mahayana principles to them and them develop the body-mind, as well as the ten dwellings, the ten practices and the ten dedications, explaining the order and function of each of these thirty minds or levels. If instead, the disciple, with evil, hateful intentions, perversely teaches them the sutras and moral codes of the two-vehicle tradition, as well as the commentaries of deluded externalists, he thereby commits a secondary offense. 16 Secondary Precept on Unsound Explanation of the Dharma a bodhisattva dharma master must first, with a wholesome mind, study the rules of deportment, as well as sutras and moral codes of the Mahayana tradition, and understand their meanings in depth. Then, whenever novices come from afar to seek instruction, he should explain, in conformity with the dharma, all the bodhisattva renunciation practices, such as burning one's body, arm, or finger, as the ultimate act in the quest for supreme enlightenment. If a novice is not prepared to follow these practices as an offering to the Buddhas, he is not a bodhisattva monk. Moreover, a bodhisattva monk should be willing to sacrifice his body and limbs for starving beasts and hungry ghosts as the ultimate act of compassion in rescuing sentient beings. After these explanations, the bodhisattva dharma master should teach the novices in an orderly way to awaken their minds. If instead, for personal gain, he refuses to teach or teaches in a confused manner, quoting passages out of order in context, or teaches in a manner that disparages the triple jewel, he commits a secondary offense. 17 Secondary Precept on Exacting Donations A disciple of the Buddha must not, for the sake of food, drink, money, possessions or fame, approach and befriend kings, princes, or high officials, and on the strength of such relationships, raise funds, or obtain other advantages. Nor may he encourage others to do so. 
these actions are called untoward. Excessive demands and lack compassion and filial piety. Such a disciple commits a secondary offense. 18. Secondary precept on serving as an inadequate master. A disciple of the Buddha should study the twelve divisions of the Dharma and recite the Bodhisattva precepts frequently. He should strictly observe these precepts in the six periods of the day and night and fully understand their meaning and principles, as well as the essence of their Buddha nature. If instead, the disciple of the Buddha fails to understand even a sentence or a verse of the moral code or the causes and conditions related to the precepts, but pretends to understand them, he is deceiving both himself and others. A disciple who understands oathing of the Dharma, yet acts as a teacher transmitting the precepts, commits a secondary offense. 19. Secondary Precept on Double Tongue Speech. A disciple of the Buddha must not, with malicious intent gossip or spread rumors and slander, create discord and disdain for virtuous people. An example is disparaging a monk who observes the Bodhisattva precepts as he makes offerings to the Buddha by holding an incense burner to his forehead. A disciple of the Buddha who does so commits a secondary offense. 20. Secondary Precept on Failure to Liberate Sentient Beings. A disciple of the Buddha should have a mind of compassion and cultivate the practice of liberating sentient beings. He must reflect thus. Throughout the eons of time, all male sentient beings have been my father, all female sentient beings my mother. I was born of them. I now slaughter them, I would be slaughtering my parents, as well as eating flesh that was once my own. This is so because all elemental earth, water, fire and air, the four constituents of all life, have previously been part of my body, part of my substance. I must therefore always cultivate the practice of liberating sentient beings and enjoin others to do likewise, as sentient beings are forever reborn, again and again, lifetime after lifetime. If a bodhisattva sees an animal on the verge of being killed, he must devise a way to rescue and protect it, helping it to escape suffering and death. The disciple should always teach the bodhisattva precepts to rescue and deliver sentient beings. On the day of his father, mother, and siblings die, he should invite Dharma Master to explain the Bodhisattva Sutras and precepts. This will generate merits and virtues and help the deceased either to achieve rebirth in the Pure Land and meet the Buddhas or to secure rebirth in the human or celestial realms. If instead, a disciple falls to do so, he commits a secondary offense. 21st Secondary Precept on Violence and Vengefulness. A disciple of the Buddha must not return anger for anger, blow for blow. He should not seek revenge, even if his father, mother, siblings, or close relatives are killed, nor should he do so if the ruler or king of his country is murdered. To take the life of one being in order to avenge the killing of another is contrary to filial piety, as we are all related through eons of birth and rebirth. Furthermore, he should not keep others in servitude, much less beat or abuse them, creating evil karma of mind, speech and body day after day, particularly the offenses of speech. How much less should he deliberately commit the seven cardinal sins? Therefore, if a bodhisattva monk lacks compassion and deliberately seeks revenge, even for an injustice done to his close relatives, he commits a secondary offense. 22nd Secondary Precept on Arrogance and Failure to Request the Dharma A disciple of the Buddha who has only recently become a monk and is still a novice in the Dharma should not be conceited. He must not refuse instruction on the sutras and moral codes. From Dharma masters on account of his own intelligence, worldly learning, high position, advanced age, noble lineage, vast understanding, great merits, extensive wealth and possessions, etc. Although these masters may be of humble birth, young in age, poor, or suffering physical disabilities, they may still have genuine virtue and deep understanding of sutras and moral codes. The novice bodhisattva should not judge dharma masters on the basis of their family background and refuse to seek instructions on the Mahayana truths from them. If he does so, he commits a secondary offense. 23rd Secondary Precept on Teaching the Dharma Grudgingly After my passing, should a disciple, with a wholesome mind, wish to receive the bodhisattva precepts, he may make a vow to do so before the images of Buddhas and bodhisattvas and practice repentance before these images for seven days. If he then experienced a vision, he has received the pesats. If he does not, he should continue doing so for 14 days, 21 days, or even a whole year, seeking to witness an auspicious sign. After witnessing such a sign, he could, in front of images of Buddhas and bodhisattvas, formally receive the precepts. If he has not witnessed such a sign, although he may have accepted the precepts before the Buddha images, he has not actually received the precepts. 
However, the witnessing of auspicious signs is not necessary if the disciple receive the precepts directly from a Dharma master who has himself received the precepts. Why is this oh? It is because this is a case of transmission from master to master, and therefore all that is required is a mind of utter sincerity and respect on the part of the disciple. If, within a radius of some thousand miles, a disciple cannot find a master capable of conferring the bodhisattva precepts, he may seek to receive them in front of Buddha or bodhisattva images. However, he must witness an auspicious sign. If a Dharma master, on account of his extensive knowledge of sutras and Mahayana moral codes as well as his close relationship with kings, princes, and high officials, refuses to give appropriate answer to student bodhisattvas seeking the meaning of sutras and moral codes, or does so grudgingly, with resentment and arrogance, he commits a secondary offense. 24th Secondary Precept on Failure to Practice Mahayana Teaching if a disciple of the Buddha fails to study Mahayana sutras and moral codes as justly and cultivate correct views, correct nature and correct dharma body, it is like abandoning the seven precious jewels for mere stones. Worldly texts and the two vehicular externalist commentaries. To do so is to create the causes and conditions that obstruct the path to enlightenment and cut himself off from his Buddha nature. It is a failure to follow the bodhisattva path. If a disciple intentionally acts in such a manner, he commits a secondary offense. 25th Secondary Precept on Unskilled Leadership of the Assembly. After my pawing, should a disciple serve as an abbot, elder master, precept master, meditation master, or guest prefect, he must develop a compassionate mind and peacefully settle differences within the assembly, skillfully administering the resources of the three jewels. Spending frugally and not treating them as his own property. If instead, he were to create disorder, provoke quarrels and disputes or squander the resources of the assembly, he would commit a secondary offense. 26th Secondary Precept on Accepting Personal Offerings. Once a disciple of the Buddha has settled down in a temple, if visiting Bodhisattva Bhikshu should arrive at the temple precincts, the guest quarters established by the king, or even the summer retreat quarters, or the quarters of the great assembly, the disciple should welcome the visiting monks and see them off. He should provide them with such essentials as food and drink, a place to live, beds, chairs, and the like. If the host does not have the necessary means, he should be willing to pawn himself or cut off and sell his own flesh. Whenever there are meal offerings and ceremonies at a layman's home, visiting monks should be given a fair share of the offerings. The abbot should send the monks, whether residents or guests, to the donor's place in turn, according to their sacerdotal age or merits and virtues. If only resident monks are allowed to accept invitations and not visiting monks, the abbot is committing a grievous offense and is behaving no differently than an animal. He is unworthy of being a monk or a son of the Buddha and is guilty of a secondary offense. 27 Secondary Precept on Accepting Discriminatory Invitation A disciple of the Buddha must not accept personal invitations nor appropriate the offerings for himself. Such offerings rightly belong to the Sangha, the whole community of monks and nuns of the Ten Directions. To accept personal offerings is to steal the possessions of the Sangha of the Ten Directions. It is tantamount to stealing what belongs to the eight fields of blessings. Buddhas, sages, dharma masters, precept masters, monks nuns, mothers, fathers, the sick. Such a disciple commits a secondary offense. 28th Secondary Precept on Issuing Discriminatory Invitation. A disciple of the Buddha, be he a bodhisattva monk, lay bodhisattva, or other donor, should, when inviting monks or nuns to conduct a prayer session, come to the temple and inform the monk in charge. The monk will then tell him. Inviting members of the Sangha according to the proper order is tantamount to inviting the Arats of the Ten Directions. To offer a discriminatory special invitation to such a worthy group as 500 rats or bodhisattva monks will not generate as much merit as inviting one ordinary monk if it is his turn. There is no provision in the teachings of the seven Buddhas for discriminatory invitations. To do so is to follow externalist practices and to contradict filial toward all sentient beings. If a disciple deliberately issues a discriminatory invitation, he commits a secondary offense. 29th Secondary Precept on Improper Livelihood. A disciple of the Buddha should not, for the sake of gain or with evil intentions, engage in the business of prostitution, selling the wiles and charms of men and women. He must also not cook for himself, milling and pounding grain. Neither may he act as a fortune teller predicting the gender of children, reading dreams and the like. 
nor shall he practice sorcery, work as a trainer of falcons or hunting dogs, nor make a living concocting hundreds and thousands of poisons from deadly snakes, insects, or from gold and silver. Such occupations lack mercy, compassion, and filial piety towards sentient beings. Therefore, if a bodhisattva intentionally engages in these occupations, he commits a secondary offense. 30th Secondary Precept on Handling Business Affairs for the Laity A disciple of the Buddha must not, with evil intentions, slander the triple jewel, while pretending to be their close adherent, preaching the truth of emptiness, while his actions are in the realm of existence. Thus, he must not handle worldly affairs for the laity, acting as a go-between or matchmaker, creating the karma of attachment. Moreover, during the six days of fasting each month and the three months of fasting each year, a disciple should strictly observe all precepts, particularly those against kiling, stealing and the rules against breaking the fast. Otherwise, the disciple commits a secondary offense. 31st Secondary Precept on Rescuing Clerics Along with Sacred Objects after my passing, in the evil periods that will follow, there will be externalists, evil persons, thieves and robbers who steal and sell statues and paintings of Buddhas, bodhisattvas and those to whom respect is due, such as their parents. They may even peddle copies of sutras and moral codes, or sell monks, nuns or those who follow the bodhisattva path, or have developed the body mind to serve as retainers or servants to officials and others. A disciple of the Buddha, upon witnessing such pitiful events, must develop a mind of compassion and find ways to rescue and protect all persons and valuables, raising funds wherever he can for this purpose. If a bodhisattva does not act in this manner, he commits a secondary offense. 32nd Secondary Precept on Harming Sentient Beings A disciple of the Buddha must not sell knives, clubs, bows, arrows, other life-taking devices, nor keep altered scales or measuring devices. He should not abuse his governmental position to confiscate people's possessions, nor should he, with malice at heart, restrain or imprison others or sabotage their success. In addition, he should not raise cats, dogs, foxes, pigs and other such animals. If he intentionally does such things, he commits a secondary offense. 33rd Secondary Precept on Watching Improper Activities a disciple of the Buddha must not, with evil intentions, watch people fighting or battling of armies, rebels, gangs and the like. He should not listen to the sounds of conned shells, drums, horns, guitars, flutes, songs or other music, nor should he be party to any form of gambling, whether dice, checkers, or the like. Furthermore, he should not practice fortune-telling or divination, nor should he be an accomplice to thieves and bandits. He must not participate in any of these activities. If instead, he intentionally does so, he commits a secondary offense. 34th Secondary Precept on Temporary Abandoning of the Bodhi Mind A disciple of the Buddha should observe the Bodhisattva precepts at all times, whether walking, standing, reclining or seated, reading and reciting them day and night. He should be resolute in keeping the precepts, as strong as a diamond, as desperate as a shipwrecked person clinging to a small log while attempting to cross the ocean, or as principled as the bhikkhu bound by reeds. Furthermore, he should always have a wholesome faith in the teachings of the Mahayana. Conscious that sentient beings are Buddhas to be while the Buddhas are realized Buddhas, he should develop the body mind and maintain it in each and every thought, without retrogression. If a bodhisattva has but a single thought in the direction of the two vehicles or externalist teachings, he commits a secondary offense. 35th Secondary Precept on Failure to Make Great Vows a bodhisattva must make many great vows, to be filial to his parents and dharma teachers, to meet good spiritual advisors, friends, and colleagues who will keep teaching him the Mahayana Sutras and moral codes, as well as the stages of bodhisattva practice, the ten dwellings, the ten practices, the ten dedications, and the ten grounds. He should further vow to understand these teachings clearly so that he can practice according to the dharma, while resolutely keeping the precepts of the Buddhas, if necessary, he should lay down his life rather than abandon this resolve. If any bodhisattva does not make such vows, he commits a secondary offense. 36th Secondary Precept on Failure to Take Solemn Oaths Once a bodhisattva has made these great vows, he should strictly keep the precepts of the Buddhas and take the following oaths. I would rather jump into a raging blaze, a deep abyss, or into a mountain of knives, than engage in impure actions with any woman, thus violating the sutras and moral codes of the Buddhas of the three periods of time. I would rather wrap myself a thousand times with a red-hot iron net, than let this body, should it break the precepts, wear clothing provided by the faithful.
I would rather swallow red hot iron pellets and drink molten iron for hundreds of thousands of eons than let this mouth, should it break the precepts, consume food and drink provided by the faithful. I would rather lie on a bone fire or burning iron net than let this body, should it break the precepts, rest on bedding, blankets and mats supplied by the faithful. I would rather be impaled for eons by hundreds of spears than let this body, should it break the precepts, receive medications from the faithful. I would rather jump into a cauldron of boiling oil and roast for hundreds of thousands of eons than let this body, should it break the precepts, receive shelter, groves, gardens, or fields from the faithful. He should also take the following oaths. I would rather be pulverized from head to toe by an iron sledgehammer than let this body, should it break the precepts, accept respect and reverence from the faithful. I would rather have both eyes blinded by hundreds of thousands of swords and spears than break the precepts by looking at beautiful forms. In the same vein, I shall keep my mind from being sullied by exquisite sounds, fragrances, food and sensations. He further vows that all sentient beings will achieve Buddhahood. If a disciple of the Buddha does not make the preceding great resolutions, he commits a secondary offense. 37 Secondary Precept on Traveling in Dangerous Areas as a cleric, a disciple of the Buddha should engage in ascetic practices twice each year. He should sit in meditation, winter and summer, and observe the summer retreat. During those periods, he should always carry 18 essentials such as a willow branch for a toothbrush, ash water for soap, the traditional three clerical robes, an incense burner, a begging bowl, a sitting mat, a water filter, bedding, copies of sutras and moral codes, as well as statues of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. When practicing austerities and when traveling, be it for 30 miles or 300 miles, a disciple of the Buddha should always have the 18 essentials with him. The two periods of austerities are from the 15th of the first lunar month to the 15th of the third lunar month, and from the 15th of the eighth lunar month to the 15th of the tenth lunar month. During the periods of austerities, he requires these 18 essentials just as a bird needs its two wings. Twice each month, the novice bodhisattva should attend the Upasattha ceremony and recite the 10 major and 48 secondary precepts. Such recitations should be done before images of the Buddhas and bodhisattvas. If only one person attends the ceremony, then he should do the reciting. If two, three, or even hundreds of thousands attend a ceremony, still only one person should recite. Everyone else should listen in silence. The one reciting should sit on a higher level than the audience, and everyone should be dressed in clerical robes. During the summer retreat, each and every activity should be managed in accordance with the Dharma. When practicing the austerities, the Buddhist disciple should avoid dangerous areas, unstable kingdoms, countries ruled by evil kings, precipitous terrains, remote wildernesses, regions inhabited by bandits, thieves, or lions, tigers, wolves, poisonous snakes, or areas subject to hurricanes, floods and fires. The disciple should avoid all such dangerous areas when practicing austerities and also when observing the summer retreat. Otherwise, he commits a secondary offense. 38 Secondary Precept on Order of Seating Within the Assembly A disciple of the Buddha should sit in the proper order when in the assembly. Those who received the Bodhisattva precepts first sit first, those who received the precepts afterwards should sit behind. Whether old or young, a bhiksu or bhiksuni, a person of status, a king, a prince, a eunuch, or a servant, etc. Each should sit according to the order in which he received the precepts. Disciples of the Buddha should not be like externalists or deluded people who base their order on age or sit without any order at all, in barbarian fashion. In my dharma, the order of sitting is based on seniority of ordination. Therefore, if a bodhisattva does not follow the order of sitting according to the dharma, he commits a secondary offense. 39 Secondary Precept on Failure to Cultivate Merits and Wisdom a disciple of the Buddha should constantly counsel and teach all people to establish monasteries, temples and pagodas in mountains and forests, gardens and fields. He should also construct stupas for the Buddhas and buildings for winter and summer retreats. All facilities required for the practice of the Dharma should be established. Moreover, a disciple of the Buddha should explain Mahayana Sutras and the Bodhisattva precepts to all sentient beings. In times of sickness, national calamities, impending warfare upon the death of one's parents, brothers and sisters, dharma masters and precept masters, a bodhisattva should lecture and explain Mahayana Sutras and the bodhisattva precepts weekly for up to seven weeks. The disciple should read, recite, and explain the Mahayana Sutras and the bodhisattva precepts in all prayer gatherings, in his business undertakings and during periods of calamities, fire, 
floods, storms, ship lost at sea in turbulent waters or stalked by demons, etc. In the same vein, he should do so in order to transcend evil karma, the three evil realms, the eight difficulties, the seven cardinal sins, all forms of imprisonment, or excessive sexual desire, anger, delusion, and illness. If a novice bodhisattva fails to act as indicated, he commits a secondary offense. 40th Secondary Precept on Discrimination and Conferring the Precepts A disciple of the Buddha should not be selective and show preference in conferring the bodhisattva precepts. Each and every person can receive the precepts, kings, princes, high officials, bhiksas, bhiksunas, laymen, laywomen, libertines, prostitutes, the gods in the eighteen Brahma heavens or the six desire heavens, asexual persons, bisexual persons, eunuchs, slaves, or demons and ghosts of all types. Buddhist disciples should be instructed to wear robes and sleep on cloth of a neutral color, formed by blending blue, yellow, red, black and purple dyes all together. The clothing of monks and nuns should, in all countries, be different from those worn by ordinary persons. Before someone is allowed to receive the bodhisattva precepts, he should be asked. Have you committed any cardinal sins? The precept master should not allow those who have committed such sins to receive the precepts. Here are the seven cardinal sins. Shedding the Buddha's blood, murdering a sage, killing one's father, one's mother, murdering a dharma teacher, neutering a precept master or disrupting the harmony of the sangha. Except for those who have committed the cardinal sins, everyone can receive the bodhisattva precepts. The dharma rules of the Buddhist order prohibit monks and nuns from bowing down before rulers, parents, relatives, demons and ghosts. Anyone who understands the explanations of the precept master can receive the bodhisattva precepts. Therefore, if a person were to come from 30 to 300 miles away, seeking the dharma and precept master out of meanness and anger does not promptly confer these precepts, he commits a secondary offense. 41st Secondary Precept on Teaching for the Sake of Profit If a disciple of the Buddha, when teaching others and developing their faith in the Mahayana, should discover that a particular person wishes to receive the bodhisattva precepts, he should act as a teaching master and instruct that person to seek out two masters, a dharma master and a precept master. These two masters should ask the precept candidate whether he has committed any of the seven cardinal sins in this life. If he has, he cannot receive the precepts. If not, he may receive the precepts. If he has broken any of the ten major precepts, he should be instructed to repent before the statues of Buddhas and Bodhiattvas. He shall do so six times a day and recite the ten major and forty-eight minor precepts, paying respect with utter sincerity to the Buddhas of the three periods of time. He should continue in this manner until he receives an auspicious response, which could occur after seven days, fourteen days, twenty-one days, or even a year. Examples of auspicious signs include experiencing the Buddha's rub the crown of one's head or seeing lights, halos, flowers and other such rare phenomena. The witnessing of an auspicious sign indicates that the candidate's karma has been dissipated. Otherwise, although he has repented, it was of no avail. He still has not received the precepts. However, the merits accrued will increase his chances of receiving the precepts in a future lifetime. Unlike the case of a major bodhisattva precept, if a candidate has violated any of the 48 secondary precepts, he can confess his infraction and sincerely repent before bodhisattva monks or nuns. After that, his offense will be eradicated. The officiating master, however, must fully understand the Mahayana sutras and moral codes, the secondary, as well as the major bodhisattva precepts, what constitutes an offense and what does not, the truth of primary meaning, as well as he various bodhisattva cultivation stages, the ten dwellings, the ten practices, the ten dedications, the ten grounds, an equal and wonderful enlightenment. He should also know the type and degree of contemplation required for entering and exiting these stages and be familiar with the ten limbs of enlightenment as well as a variety of other contemplations. If he is not familiar with the above and, out of greed for fame, disciples or offerings, he makes a pretense of understanding the sutras and moral codes, he is deceiving himself as well as others. Hence, if he intentionally acts as precept master, transmitting the precepts to others, he commits a secondary offense. 42nd Secondary Precept on Reciting the Precepts to Evil Persons A disciple of the Buddha should not, with a greedy motive, expound the great precepts of the Buddhas before those who have not received them, externalists or persons with heterodox views. Except in the case of kings or supreme rulers, he may not expound the precepts before any such persons. 
persons who hold heterodox views and do not accept the precepts of the Buddhas are animalistic in nature. They will not, lifetime after lifetime, encounter the triple jewel. They are as senseless as trees and stones, they are no different from wooden stumps. Hence, if a disciple of the Buddha expounds the precepts of the seven Buddhas before such persons, he commits a secondary offense. 43rd Secondary Precept on Thoughts of Violating the Precepts. If a disciple of the Buddha joins the order out of pure faith, receives the correct precepts of the Buddhas, but then develops thoughts of violating the precepts, he is unworthy of receiving any offerings. From the faithful, unworthy of walking on the ground of his motherland, unworthy of drinking its water. 5,000 guardian spirits constantly block his way, calling him evil thief. These spirits always follow him into people's homes, villages and towns, sweeping away his very footprints. Everyone curses such a disciple, calling him a thief within the Dharma. All sentient beings avert their eyes, not wishing to see him. A disciple of the Buddha who breaks the precepts is no different from an animal or a wooden stump. Hence, if a disciple intentionally violates the correct precepts, he commits a secondary offense. 44th Secondary Precept on Failure to Honor the Sutras and Moral Codes A disciple of the Buddha should always single-mindedly receive, observe, read and recite the Mahayana Sutras and Moral Codes. He should copy the sutras and moral codes onto bark, paper, fine cloth, or bamboo clats, and not hesitate to use his own skin as paper, draw his own blood for ink and his marrow for ink solvent, or split his bones for use as pens. He should use precious gems, priceless incense and flowers and other precious things to make and adorn covers and cases to store the sutras and codes. Hence, if he does not make offerings to the sutras and moral codes in accordance with the Dharma, he commits a secondary offense. 45th Secondary Precept on Failure to Teach Sentient Beings. A disciple of the Buddha should develop a mind of great compassion. Whenever he enters people's homes, villages, cities or towns, and sees sentient beings, he should say aloud, you sentient beings should all take the three refuges and receive the ten major bodhisattva precepts. Should he come across cows, pigs, horses, sheep and other kinds of animals, he should concentrate and say aloud you are now animals, you should develop the body mind. A bodhisattva, wherever he goes, be it climbing a mountain, entering a forest, crossing a river, or walking through a field, should help all sentient beings develop the body mind. If a disciple of the Buddha does not wholeheartedly teach and rescue sentient beings in such a manner, he commits a secondary offense. 46th Secondary Precept on Preaching in an Inappropriate Manner A disciple of the Buddha should always have a mind of great compassion to teach and transform sentient beings. Whether visiting wealthy and aristocratic donors or addressing dharma gatherings, he should not remain standing while explaining the dharma to laymen, but should occupy a raised seat in front of the lay assembly. A bhikkhu serving as dharma instructor must not be standing while lecturing to the fourfold assembly. During such lectures, the dharma master should sit on a raised seat amidst flowers and incense, while the fourfold assembly must listen from lower seats. The assembly must respect and follow the master like filial sons following their parents or brahmins worshipping fire. If a dharma master does not follow these rules while preaching the dharma, he commits a secondary offense. 47 Secondary Precept on Regulations Against the Dharma A disciple of the Buddha who has accepted the precepts of the Buddhas with a faithful mind must not use his high official position as a king, prince, official, etc. to undermine the moral code of the Buddhas. He may not establish rules and regulations preventing the four kinds of lay disciples from joining the order and practicing the way, nor may he prohibit the making of Buddha or Bodhisattva images, statues and stupas, or the printing and distribution of sutras and codes. Likewise, he must not establish rules and regulations placing controls on the fourfold assembly. If highly placed lay disciples engage in actions contrary to the Dharma, they are no different from vassals in the service of illegitimate rulers. A bodhisattva should rightfully receive respect and offerings from all. If instead, he is forced to defer to officials, this is contrary to the dharma, contrary to the moral code. Hence, if a king or official has received the bodhisattva precepts with a wholesome mind, he should avoid offenses that harm the three jewels. If instead, he intentionally commits such acts, he is guilty of a secondary offense. 48th Secondary Precept on Destroying the Dharma a disciple of the Buddha who becomes a monk with wholesome intentions must not, for fame or profit, explain the precepts to kings or officials in such a way as to cause monks, nuns or laymen, who have received the bodhisattva precepts to be tied up, thrown into prison, conscripted or enslaved.
If a bodhisattva acts in such a manner, he is no different from a worm in a lion's body, eating away at the lion's flesh. This is not something a worm living outside the lion can do. Likewise, only disciples of the Buddhas can bring down the Dharma, no externalist or celestial demon can do so. Those who have received the precepts of the Buddha should protect and observe them, just as a mother would care for her only child or a filial son his parents. They must not bring down the Dharma. If a bodhisattva hears externalists or evil-minded persons speak ill of or disparage the precepts of the Buddhas, he should feel as though his heart were pierced by three hundred spears or his body stabbed with a thousand knives or thrashed with a thousand clubs. He would rather suffer in the hells himself for a hundred eons than hear evil beings disparage the precepts of the Buddha. How much worse it would be if the disciple were to break the precepts himself or incite others to do so. This is indeed an unfilial mind. Hence, if he violates the precepts intentionally, he commits a secondary offense. 184. Lay Buddhists. The Buddhist community consists of two groups of people, the Sangha and the laity. The word Sangha means friendly community. It usually refers to the Buddhist monks and nuns. They live in monasteries. The laity includes Buddhist men and women who do not become monks and nuns. They usually live at home with their families. Laymen or laywomen who remain at home and observe the Eight Commandments. Buddhism does not demand of the lay follower all that a member of the order is expected to observe. But whether monk or layman, moral habits are essential to the upward path. One who becomes a Buddhist by taking the three refuges is expected, at least, to observe the five basic precepts, which is the very starting point on the path. They are not restricted to a particular day or place, but are to be practiced throughout life everywhere, always. There is also the possibility of their being violated, except those who have attained stages of sanctity. However, according to Buddhism, wrongdoing is not regarded as a sin, for the Buddha is not a lawyer or a judge who punished the bad and rewarded the good deeds of beings. Lay people should always remember that the doer of the deed is responsible for his actions, he suffers or enjoys the consequences, and it is his concern either to do good or to be a transgressor. A lay person is one who resides at home, in a family, not leaving home as a monk or a nun. All sincere Buddhists have had one and the same goal, which is the extinction of self. Generally speaking, their practices tend to foster such easily recognizable spiritual virtues as patience, serenity, detachment, consideration and tenderness for others. Lay people are also called lady who observe the first eight commandments, one of the eight differentiated rules of liberation for the eight orders. Also called outer company. In contrast with the inner company are the monks and nuns. Also called white clothes, said to be that of Brahmins and other high-class people, but now the term is used for common people, especially lady or laymen. A lay person is one who believes, accepts Buddhism as his religion, studies, disseminates and endeavors to live the fundamental principles of the Buddha Dharma. To become a Buddhist, one should take refuge in the three gems, observe the five basic precepts, and know the main purposes of Buddhism. A lay person must take refuge in the three gems, practice the five commandments, and know the main purpose of Buddhism. Not committing any evils, doing all good, purifying the mind, and understand the path to that goal. A lay Buddhist should always remember the followings. Must be willing to change and repent when mistakes are made. Whatever harmful acts, karma, of the body, speech and mind that you have done in a disturbed mental state towards the three jewels of refuge, your parents, your venerable masters and all other sentient beings, either grave or light, wrongdoings, must be sincerely repented. A lay Buddhist should always give the priority to the purification of the three karmas of the body, speech and mind before anything else. Must be willing to abandon the tendencies to chase constantly after worldly matters. Must be willing to return to follow the way of enlightenment. Must practice just as the Buddha taught. A lay Buddhist should always not to look for people's mistakes. The Buddha taught. When we do not see others' mistakes or see only our own rightness, we are naturally respected by seniors and admired by juniors. According to the Dharmapada, sentence 50, the Buddha taught. Let not one look on the faults of others, nor things left done and undone by others, but one's own deeds done and undone. A lay Buddhist should always be content with few desires. Content with few desires. The Oduik means having few desires, Trituk means being content. Knowing how to feel satisfied with few possessions means being content with material conditions that allow us to be healthy and strong enough to practice the way. Knowing how to feel satisfied and being content with material conditions is an effective way to cut through the net of passions and desires, attain a peaceful state of body and mind, and accomplish our supreme goal of cultivation. 
Although knowing that for lay people whose life is still subject to worldly affairs, however, a devotee should always follow the Buddha's guidance in his daily life. The first step to becoming a member of the laity is to go for refuge in the Triple Gem, the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha. Then, they willingly observe the five precepts in their daily life. The laity plays an important role in Buddhism as they care for and support the Sangha. They build the temples and monasteries. They give offerings of food, clothing, bedding and medicine to the Sangha. In return, the Sangha carries on the work of Buddhism and teaches the laity on the Dharma. In this way the Sangha and the laity benefit each other, and together, they keep the Dharma alive. Whether one is a member of the Sangha or the laity, they all are Buddhists, and they should do their best to live an honest life, show compassion to all living beings, and set a good example. Even when they are working or meditating, it should be for the benefit of others as well as for themselves. To help lay people overcome their disturbing attitudes and stop committing harmful actions, the Buddha set out five precepts. During a brief ceremony performed by a monk or nun, lay people can take refuge in the Triple Gem, Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. At the same time, they can take any of the five lay precepts and become either an Upasaka or Upasaka. When performing the ceremony, some masters include only the first precept of not killing and let lay people decide themselves to take any or all of the other four. Other masters give all five precepts at the time of giving refuge. Lay people may also take eight precepts for a period of 24 hours every month. Many lay people like to take the eight precepts on new and full moon days, or the end of the lunar month, or on Buddhist festivals, although they may be taken on any day. The first five of these eight are similar to the five lay prakpits, with the exception that the prakpit against unwise sexual behavior become abstinent from sex because the precepts are kept for only one day, see eight precepts. In Thailand's and Cambodia's traditions, there is a custom whereby most young men become monks and hold the Sramanera precepts for three months, at least once during their lives. They usually do this when they are young adults, as it gives them a foundation in strict ethics and is very auspicious for their families. At the end of the three-month period, they give back their precepts and return to worldly family life. 185. Owing. Bowing with the meaning of honor and respect or having regard and consideration for someone. In Buddhism, prostration is an act of paying homage to an elder, a master, a nun, a monk, a bodhisattva, or a Buddha. However, the best way to respect the Buddha is to follow his advice. Not to do evil, to do good, and to purify one's mind. Besides, bowing or field of reverence is one of the extraordinary methods of cultivation. Worship and support of the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha. The field of religion and reverence of the Buddhas, the saints, the priesthood is a means to attain blessing. When receiving something from someone, a bhiksu or bhiksuni should bow in a manner of honor and respect, joining his or her palms like a lotus bud. Practically speaking, bowing is a very important outward form of the practice that should be done correctly. Bring the forehead all the way to the floor. Have elbows near the knees about three inches apart. We use outward form to train ourselves to harmonize body and mind. Do not make mistake of watching how others bow. Judging others will only increase our pride. Watch ourselves instead. Bow often, get rid of our pride. Theoretically speaking, ancient virtues taught. Pay homage while abiding nowhere and transform beings to go to rebirth in the pure land. Bow slowly, mindful of our body. It is a good remedy for our conceit. We should bow often. When we bow three times, we can keep in mind the qualities of the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, that is, the qualities of purity, radiance, and peace. We bow as if not bowing for merit and virtue. That is to say, after we have done something, do not be attached to the merit and virtue that we have created. That is called true bowing. There are many different kinds of bowing. The first kind is the salutation with joined hands or the joining together of the palms. To bring the ten fingers or two palms together, the mother of all manual signs. Salutation with joined hands or joining the palms together when saluting. The open hands placed side by side and slightly hollowed, as if by a beggar to receive food, hence when raised to the forehead, a mark of supplication, reverence, salutation. Anajali is a Sanskrit term meaning to bring the ten fingers or two palms together. In Anajali, we place our palm together to express our reliance, thankfulness, and oneness with the Buddha. The right hand symbolizes the Buddha and the left hand the human being. When they are placed together, we feel that the Buddha is in us and we are in the Buddha. Anajali is a symbol of the perfect unity of men and the Buddha. 
Besides, the open hands placed side by side and slightly hollowed, as if by a beggar to receive food, hands when raised to the forehead, is also a mark of supplication, reverence, salutation. The second type is bowing to the Buddha recitation. This is one of the ten kinds of oral recitation. This technique consists of making bows as we recite the Buddha's name. Either we recite once before each bow or we bow as we recite, regardless of the number of recitations. The bowing should be supple yet deliberate complementing recitation, bowing and reciting perfectly synchronized. If we add a sincere and earnest mind, body, speech and mind are gathered together. Except for the words Amitabha Buddha, there is not the slightest diluted thought. This method has the ability to destroy the karma of drowsiness. Its benefits are very great because the practitioner engages in recitation with his body, speech and mind. A lay practitioner of old used to follow this method, and each day and night, he would bow and recite an average of 1,000 times. However, this practice is the particular domain of those with strong mind power. Lacking this quality, it is difficult to persevere because with extended bowing, the body easily grows weary, leading to discouragement. Therefore, this method is normally used in conjunction with other methods and is not practiced in exclusively. The third type of bowing is the prostrations every third step. According to the Vajrayana tradition, prostrations every third step means going around the central Lhasa temple, made by prostrations every third step, to get rid of evils or obtain blessing. The fourth type of bowing is the embrace the feet. To embrace the feet, i.e. Buddha's feet in reverence or pleading. To bow the head and face in reverence, to fall prostrate in reverence. According to Buddhist tradition since the time of the Buddha, a Buddhist would embrace the Buddha's feet in reverence or pleading, or to extend the arms in that posture. The fifth type of bowing is the pratiksina. Pratiksina is a Sanskrit term for circumambulation. Circumambulation with the right shoulder towards the object of homage. This is one of the most common merit-making activities throughout the Buddhist world, popular among both monastics and laypeople. It takes different forms, but its central practice is walking a circular route around a holy place in a clockwise direction, an exception to this is the non-Buddhist Tibetan bone po tradition, whose members circumambulate in a counterclockwise. The probable reason for the clockwise orientation for Buddhists is the Indian notion that the left hand is ritually impure. Besides, there are nine other ways of showing respect in India. According to Shwant Sang, there are nine ways of showing respect in India and it is time. They were saluting by asking about welfare, speaking softly, saluting by bowing the head, saluting by holding high hands, saluting by bowing head with folded hands, saluting by bending the knee, saluting by kneeling, saluting by placing two hands and knees on the ground, saluting by placing two elbows and knees on the ground and saluting by humbly and submissively prostrating the whole body on the ground. According to Buddhism, when prostrating, one must wholeheartedly have physical verbal mental prostrations. First, physical prostration, which is primarily an act of paying homage with the body. It could assume various forms. For Buddhists there is a particular way of prostration by joining the palms as a bud of a lotus flower. Besides, to bow down one's head before is also an act of physical respect. Second, verbal homage, with many ways of verbal homage. Repeating mantras is one of them. Recitation of the Buddha's name is another. Vow to seek refuge in a Buddha when seeing an image of that Buddha is also an act of paying homage through speech. Third, mental prostration, which is very important. You may not be physically prostrating us using verbal expressions in respect, but there is no telling how strong your inner mental respect may be. According to the Tibetan tradition, people prostrate the original teacher with many meanings. First, Vajra holder, add your lotus feet I prostrate. Your compassion grants even the sphere of bliss. The supreme state of the three kayas, in an instant guru with a jewel-like body. Second, we prostrate at your feet holy refuge protector. You are the wisdom knowledge of all infinite conquerors appearing in any way that subdues. With supreme skillful means, you manifest as a saffron robed monk. Third, we prostrate at your feet venerable guru. You eliminated all faults and their instincts and are a treasury of infinite precious qualities. Sole source of benefit and bliss without exception. Fourth, we prostrate to you kind guru. Teacher of gods and all, in nature all Buddhas, the source of 84,000 pure dharmas, your tower above the whole host of areas. Fifth, we prostrate manifesting as many bodies as atoms of the world. To gurus dwelling in the three times and ten directions, the three supreme jewels and all worthy of homage with faith, conviction and denotion of lyric praise. Besides, devout Buddhists should always bow and prostrate to the Buddha. 
action in all Buddha lands, honoring all Buddhas, one of the ten kinds of action of great enlightening beings. Enlightening beings who abide by these can achieve the action of Buddhas that has no coming or going. Bodhisattvas take honoring the Buddhas as a reliance because their faith is purified. This is one of the ten kinds of reliance of great enlightening beings. According to the Flower Adornment Sutra, Chapter 38, Detachment from the World, the Great Enlightening Being universally good, told universal wisdom that offsprings of Buddha, Great Enlightening Beings, have ten kinds of reliance, which help them be able to obtain abodes of the unexcelled great knowledge of Buddhas. Since Zir Buddhists should follow good example of Great Enlightening Beings, honor and provide for all Buddhas. Bowing and post-ration to the Buddha are humble expressions of respect and appreciation for the historical Buddha, our teacher, who understood the truth of the universe and our nature. Based upon his kindness and compassion to liberate all sentient beings from suffering, the Buddha serves as an excellent model for humanity. Therefore, in bowing before the Buddha, we also reminded of our own Buddha nature. We humbly examine our mind and renew our vow to remove any obstacles from our mind and life, which prevent us from becoming a fully enlightened Buddha, manifesting the kindness, compassion and wisdom our teacher has shown to us, in order to benefit all sentient beings. When we bow to the Buddhas, we should concentrate single-mindedly and show respect with our bodies. Bowing to the Buddhas can eradicate obstructions which result from offenses. It is said, to bow before the Buddhas can eradicate offenses as numerous as the grains of sand in the Ganges, for if offenses were solid objects they would fill up worlds as numerous as the Ganges as sands. This is the first of the ten conducts and vows of Samantabhadra Bodhisattva, universal worthy Bodhisattva, means to have a mind of deep faith and understanding of all Buddhas, as if they were before our eyes, and to keep our body, mouth and mind karma completely. The realm of space is inexhausted, our worshipping and respecting all Buddhas never end, the realm of living beings is inexhausted, and the afflictions of living beings are inexhaustible, our worshipping and respecting all Buddhas never end. Bowing is a very important outward form of the practice that should be done correctly. Bring the forehead all the way to the floor. Have elbows near the knees about three inches apart. Bow slowly, mindful of our body. It is a good remedy for our conceit. We should bow often. When we bow three times, we can keep in mind the qualities of the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, that is, the qualities of purity, radiance, and peace. We use outward form to train ourselves, to harmonize body and mind. Do not make mistake of watching how others bow. Judging others will only increase our pride. Watch ourselves instead. Bow often, get rid of our pride. Bowing and prostrating is also one of the ten kinds of oral recitation. This technique consists of making bows as we recite the Buddha's name. Either we recite once before each bow or we bow as we recite, regardless of the number of recitations. The bowing should be supple yet deliberate, complementing. Recitation, bowing and reciting perfectly synchronized. If we add a sincere and earnest mind, body, speech and mind are gathered together. Except for the words Amitabha Buddha, there is not the slightest diluted thought. This method has the ability to destroy the karma of drowsiness. Its benefits are very great because the practitioner engages in recitation with his body, speech and mind. A lay practitioner of old used to follow this method, and each day and night, he would bow and recite an average of 1,000 times. However, this practice is the particular domain of those with strong mind power. Lacking this quality, it is difficult to persevere because with extended bowing, the body easily grows weary, leading to discouragement. Therefore, this method is normally used in conjunction with other methods and is not practiced in exclusively. 186. Worshipping. According to our old customs, Buddhists worship ancestors to show our appreciations. According to Buddhism, worshipping ancestors with the hope of relieving their karma is not a bad custom. Buddhists diligently cultivate is the best way to show our appreciations to our ancestors. However, some Buddhists misunderstand about Buddhism and consider the worshipping the most important issue in Buddhism. According to the public belief, when there is a passing away person in a family, people usually perform a memorial ceremony on behalf of a deceased on what is believed by Buddhists to be the final day of the bardo period, in the intermediate state between death and rebirth. Vietnamese people have the custom of ancestor worship for a very long time. Vietnamese people have long believed in the existence of the solar consciousness after death. Ancestors are thought to watch over and to support their living descendants. Thus, living descendants always worship their ancestors with ultimate respect. 
Vietnamese people celebrate death anniversary not only for their deceased parents, but also for their grandparents, great grandparents, and great great grandparents. They can celebrate with a party or with the simplest ancestral ritual of burning incense and bowing before their ancestors' altars or before their ancestors' portraits. In some families, beside placing offerings of food and drink in front of the altar, they also have the custom to burn paper money for their ancestors. In addition, in some areas in central Vietnam, there still exist some clan temples which worship ancestors of the same surnames. It is no doubt that ancestor worship has helped our people maintain unity and continuity, maintaining generations. According to our old customs, Buddhists worship ancestors to show our appreciations. According to Buddhism, worshiping ancestors, with the hope of relieving their karma, is not a bad custom. Buddhists diligently cultivate is the best way to show our appreciations to our ancestors. However, some Buddhists misunderstand about Buddhism and consider the worshiping the most important issue in Buddhism. Buddhism never encouraged Buddhists to worship their ancestors blindly. On the contrary, Buddhism always promotes ancestor worship reasonably by the practice of chanting sutras for the dead, hoping to relieve their karma. Besides, usually on 15th of the third lunar month, people celebrate the Xingming festival to honor their ancestors and departed spirits. East Asian people such as Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Vietnamese, often celebrate this festival by going to the cemetery to cut grasses, clean and offer food and fruits on their ancestors' tombs. According to Buddhist traditions, Buddhists also have the custom of worshipping the Buddha. In India, after the Buddha's Parinirvana, Buddhists give the Buddha all the honors due to a Hindu incarnate god. They began to worship the image of the Buddha for the same reasons as the Hindu, namely to stimulate feeling and meditation. It is now everyone accepted that the worship of idols among the Hindus is as old as 500 to 450 BC nowadays, in Ceylon, Burma, China, Vietnam, and other Buddhist countries, people worship the Buddha's image in the same fashion as the Hindus do in India, by offering flowers, food, cloth, incense and prayers. They also act in the making of an image as the painting of the eyes, a magical rite as in India. They believe that to do this the image is vivified into godship. However, sincere Buddhists should always remember that the Buddha never approved of the idea of installing his image for worship in stupas. Devout Buddhists not only not to take the image as visible representations of God, but also not to consider that the idol contains in its substance any portion of all-pervading divinity. Buddhists should reverence the Buddha's statue and other related precious dharma things as mementos of the greatest, wisest, most benevolent and compassionate man in this world. To us, the Buddha seems more to be revered and beloved than any great men. Devout Buddhists should always remember that from the beginning, the Buddha condemned the observance of ceremonies and other external practices, which only tend to increase our spiritual blindness and our clinging to more superstitions. Buddhists offer flowers and incense to the Buddha as an outward form of respect to the Buddha. When we offer flowers, we think that as those flowers fade we also fade and die, therefore, there is nothing in this world for us to cling on. However, when offering to the Buddha, Buddhists take five kinds of incense or fragrance, corresponding with the five kinds of Dharmakaya, five attributes of Dharmakaya or spiritual body of the Tathagata. The Dharmakaya is above all moral conditions, the Dharmakaya is tranquil, and apart from all false ideas, the Dharmakaya is wise and omniscient, the Dharmakaya is free, unlimited, unconditioned. Which is the state of Nirvana, and the Dharmakaya has perfect knowledge. 187. Worshipping the eye images of the saints. To make an image, the first one made of the Buddha is attributed to Udayana, king of Kasambi, a contemporary of Sakyamuni, who is said to have made an image of the Buddha after his nirvana, in sandalwood, five feet high. People believe that when they make a statue of the Buddha, in the next lives they will have a clear vision, they will not be born in the evil places, they will always be born in a noble and good family, they will be very wealthy, and they will be able to revere the triple jewel, and so on. In fact, according taught the Buddha, sincere Buddhists need no semblance or appearance. Before reaching the stage of bodhisattva known as joy, a bodhisattva enters into the realm of no shadows. A bodhisattva on going up to the seventh stage, a bodhisattva still has a trace of mindfulness, but at the eighth the state of imagelessness or no conscious drivings obtains. It is by means of prajna that the imagelessness and the supernatural glory are realized. Sincere Buddhists should always remember that the number of statues we make doesn't matter, it does matter how we cultivate to improve ourselves in this very life.
Sin sincere Buddhists should always remember that worshipping the image of the Buddha to pay respect to what the image stand for, not to worship the image itself. According to the Earth Store Bodhisattva Sutra, Chapter 13, the Buddha told empty space treasure Bodhisattva. If gods, dragons, or spirits of the present or future hear Earth Store's name, bow to his image, or merely hear of his past vows, deeds, and practices, and then praise him and gaze at and worship him, they will benefit in seven ways. They will quickly reach the sage's ground, their evil karma will be eradicated, all the Buddhas will protect and be near them, they will not retreat from body. Their inherent powers will increase, they will know their past lives, and they will ultimately realize Buddhahood. According to the Sutra of the Past Vows of Earth Store Bodhisattva, Chapter 11, the Dharma protection of an earth spirit, the earth spirit firm and stable, spoke to the Buddha and said. World Honored One. As I regard the living beings of the present and future, I see those who make shrines of clay, stone, bamboo, or wood, and set them on pure ground in the southern part of their dwellings. They place within the shrines an image of earth store bodhisattva, either sculpted, painted, or made of gold, silver, copper, or iron. They then burn incense, make offerings, behold, worship, and praise him. Such people will receive ten kinds of benefits. What are these ten? First, their lands will be fertile. Second, their families and homes will always be peaceful. Third, their deceased ancestors will be born in the heavens. Fourth, those still alive will have benefit and will have their lifespan increased. Fifth, they will obtain what they want. Sixth, they will not encounter the disasters of water and fire. Seventh, they will avoid unforeseen calamities. Eighth, their nightmares will cease. Ninth, they will be protected by spirits during their comings and goings. Tenth, they will encounter many causes. Besides, according to the Earth Store Bodhisattva Sutra, Chapter 13, the Buddha told Empty Space Treasure Bodhisattva. Listen attentively. Listen attentively. I shall enumerate them and describe them to you. If there are good men or women in the future who see Earth Store Bodhisattva's image, or who hear this sutra or read or recite it, who use incense, flowers, food and drink, clothing, or gems as offerings, or if they praise, gaze upon, and worship him, they will benefit in 28 ways. Gods and dragons will be mindful of them and protect them, the fruits of their goodness will increase daily, they will accumulate superior causes of sagehood, they will not retreat from body, their food and drink will be abundant, epidemics will not touch them, they will not encounter disasters of fire and water. They will not have any difficulties with thieves or armed robbers, they will be respected by all who see them, they will be aided by ghosts and spirits, women will be reborn as men, if born as women, they will be daughters of kings and ministers, they will have handsome features, they will often be born in the heavens, they may be emperors or kings, they will know their past lives. They will attain whatever they seek, their families will be happy, all disasters will be eradicated, cognate viok nio no true hon. They will eternally be apart from bad karmic paths, they will always arrive at their destination, at night their dreams will be peaceful and happy, their deceased ancestors will leave suffering behind. They will receive the blessings from their past lives to aid their rebirth, they will be praised by the sages, they will be intelligent, and they will have sharp faculties, they will have magnanimous, kind and sympathetic, compassionate hearts, and finally they will ultimately realize Buddhahood. 188. Day on which a particular Buddha or Bodhisattva is worshipped. According to Buddhist traditions, the day of the month on which a particular Buddha or Bodhisattva is worshipped, he is being in special charge of mundane affairs on that day, lunar calendar. These days extend from the first to the thirtieth day of the lunar calendar month. The first is the day of the Dhyana Light Buddha on the first day of the month. The second is the day of the Dipankara Buddha on the second day of the month. The third is the day of the Prabhudaratna on the third day of the month. The fourth is the day of the Aksabhya Buddha on the fourth day of the month. The fifth is the day of the Maitreya Bodhisattva on the fifth of the month. The sixth is the day of the 20,000 Lamb Buddha on the sixth day of the month. The seventh is the day of the 30,000 Lamb Buddha on the seventh day of the month. The eighth is the day of the Bhaisajaraja Samajata Buddha on the eighth day of the month. The ninth is the day of the Mahabhijnajnanabhibhu Buddha on the ninth day of the month. The tenth is the day of the Kandra Surya Pradipa Buddha on the tenth day of the month. The eleventh is the day of the Delightful Buddha on the eleventh day of the month. The twelfth is the day of the Unconquerable Buddha on the twelfth day of the month. The thirteenth is the day of the Akasagarbha Bodhisattva, Bodhisattva of Space, on the thirteenth day of the month. The fourteenth is the day of the Samantabhadra Bodhisattva on the fourteenth day of the month. The fifteenth is the day of the Amitabha Buddha on the fifteenth of the month. The sixteenth is the day of the Dharani Bodhisattva on the sixteenth of the month. 
The 17th is the day of the Nagarjuna Bodhisattva on the 17th of the month. The 18th is the day of the Kuan Yin or Avalokitesvara Bodhisattva on the 18th of the month. The 19th is the day of the Sunlight Bodhisattva on the 19th of the month. The 20th is the day of the, the Moonlight Bodhisattva on the 20th of the month. The 21st is the day of the Infinite Resolve Bodhisattva on the 21st day of the month. The 22nd is the day of the Abhandata Bodhisattva on the 22nd day of the month. The 23rd is the day of the Mahasthamaprapta Bodhisattva on the 23rd day of the month. The 24th is the day of the Earth Store Bodhisattva on the 24th of the month. The 25th is the day of the Manjusri Bodhisattva on the 25th of the month. The 26th is the day of the Supreme Bhaisajaraja Samajata Bodhisattva on the 26th day of the month. The 27th is the day of the Virakana Buddha on the 27th day of the month. The 28th is the day of the Virakana Buddha on the 28th of the month. The 29th is the day of the Bhaisajaraja Samajata Bodhisattva on the 29th day of the month. The 30th is the day of the Sakyamuni Buddha on the 30th of the month. 180 Buddhist is the one who believes in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. One who accepts Buddhism as his religion. One who studies, disseminates and endeavors to live the fundamental principles of the Buddha Dharma. There are no special rites to observe to become a Buddhist. However, a Buddhist, especially laymen and lay women, should follow the five precepts, not to kill, not to steal, not to commit adultery, not to lie, and not to drink liquor. The first step to become a Buddhist is to take refuge in the Triple Gem to affirm our spiritual strength by empowering the confidence and rationale in us during times of adversity and confrontation. This also steers us in the right direction of living our lives in a more meaningful way. Devout lay disciples including two classes of Upasaka and Upasaka. Disciples in both forms of Buddhism, Theravada and Mahayana, is a person who vows to join the religion by striving to take refuge in the Charatna and to keep the five precepts at all times and the eight precepts on Upasatha days and who tries to follow the eightfold path whilst living in the world. They are Buddhist supporters by offering material supplies, food, clothes, and so on. Countries with Buddhist tradition, formal ordination of lay followers is extremely important for this is the central ceremony of faith for them to lead a virtuous life. To become a devoted, good, Buddhist, beside keeping five or ten basic precepts, disseminates and endeavors to live the fundamental principles of the Buddha Dharma, one must meet the criteria taught by the Buddha. First of all, that Buddhist must observe the five cardinal virtues, five constant virtues. The first constant virtue is the benevolence which concerns attitude. The noble man desires to be in harmony with other men. He knows that he cannot fulfill his role in daily life unless he is cooperative and accommodating. The right benevolence is revealed through conduct. People have the seed of such a benevolence within them, but it must be helped to develop. This virtuous attitude is sometimes thought of as an inner law of self-control. The second constant virtue is the righteousness or right moral courage. The noble man should develop the righteousness necessary to remain loyal to himself and charitable toward his neighbors. The third constant virtue is the propriety or civility or right procedure. Constant virtue with the propriety is one of the most important virtues of the five constant virtues. The man of noble mind has made a study of the rules of conduct. He has learned how to apply them in every incident he faces. He knows all the rules for etiquette, which set forth what each social situation requires of the completely humanized person. He knows all the ceremonies and rituals centering around ancestor reverence. He knows how to sit, how to stand, how to walk, how to converse, and how to control his facial expression on all occasions. Yet all these rituals and procedures are without value if a man does not have the proper attitude. A man without charity in his heart, what is he to do with these rigid ceremonies? The fourth constant virtue is the good knowledge is the fourth constant virtue. The noble man is a knowing man, for a person must be educated in order to respond to all circumstances in the right way. The Confucianist's goal is to grow gradually from rules to habits. When Confucius stressed the importance of education, he was not suggesting a new idea. He was repeating and emphasizing what the ancients had said. The social order depends upon fundamental morality, the morality of proper words and actions. Also like the ancients, Confucius believed that morality was to be applied in all levels of life. But in a very significant way to the ruling level. For the rulers were the teachers of all. They taught the needed morality most effectively when they set a good example and when they governed kindly. The fifth constant virtue is loyalty. The noble man should keep for himself the loyalty, does what he speaks and speaks only what he hears. When he promises something, even though whatever happens, he still does his best to fulfill his promise. 
Furthermore, the nobleman always knows what his duty is on each occasion, and he always knows how to do that duty. Because he has developed the seeds of virtue within his nature, he is in harmony with everything in the universe. In order to become a devout Buddhist, naturally that Buddhist must take refuge in the Taratna and to keep the basic five precepts or any other precepts for laypeople. To take refuge in Sakyamuni Buddha, the founding master, to take refuge in the Dharma, the supreme teachings of the Buddha, and to take refuge in the Sangha, the congregation of monks and nuns who have renounced the world and have devoted their effort to a lifelong practice of the Dharma. To keep the basic five precepts include not to kill, not to steal, not to commit sexual misconduct, not to lie, and not to drink liquor. Besides, a devout Buddhist always hears the truth with a faith mind, always knows the main purpose of Buddhism, always does good deeds, always tries not committing any evils or not to do evil deeds, and always tries to purify the body and mind. A devout Buddhist should always venerate, respect the elderly, should always love and care for the young, and should always comfort those who encounter calamities. A devout Buddhist should always understand the path to that goal and always try to practice the Buddha's teachings correctly. That Buddhist must be willing to change and repent when mistakes are made, must be willing to abandon the tendencies to chase constantly after worldly matters, must be willing to return to follow the way of enlightenment, and must practice just as the Buddha taught. Besides, there are four great debts which lay people should always remember. The first debt is the debt to the triple jewel, Buddha, Dharma, Sangha. The second debt is the debt to our parents and teachers. The third debt is the debt to our spiritual friends. The fourth debt is the debt we owe all sentient beings. Devout Buddhists should try to train ourselves in accordance to the examples set by the Buddhas, Dharma and Sangha. If we take their behavior as a model, we will eventually become like them. Devout Buddhists should avoid being self-indulgent and running after any desirable object we see. In addition, we should not crave for money because craving for money and position leads us to obsession and constant dissatisfaction. We will be much happier when we enjoy pleasures of the senses in moderation. Devout Buddhists should avoid arrogantly criticizing whatever we dislike. We have a tendency to see others' faults and overlook our own. This doesn't make us or others any happier. So, devout Buddhists had better correct our own faults than point out those of others. Devout Buddhists should try our best to avoid the ten destructive actions, at the same time, try to do the ten good deeds. The Buddha advised us to avoid ten destructive actions. By deliberately refraining from these ten destructive actions, we engage in the ten constructive or positive actions. For example, deciding not to lie to our employer about the time spent working on a project is in itself a positive action. This has many benefits. Employer will trust our word in the future, we will live according to our ethical principles, and we will create the cause to have temporal happiness and spiritual realizations. According to late most venerable Xuan Hua in the Dharma Talks, Book 2, first of all, devout Buddhists are not to contend. If we do not contend, then we will not try to kill sentient beings. Killing occurs because thoughts of contention take control. When we start contending, we have the attitude of get out of my way or die. The casualties that result are beyond count. Devout Buddhists should try to get rid of this dangerous contention. Second, devout Buddhists are not to be greedy. If we are not greedy, then we will not steal. Why do we want to steal others' things? It is because of greed. If we are not greedy, then even if people want to offer us something, we would not want to take it. Devout Buddhists should try to get rid of greed. Third, devout Buddhists are not to seek for dares. If we seek for nothing, we will not have thoughts of lust. Thoughts of lust arise because we seek for them. Women seek men, and men seek women. If we do not seek anything, then how could we have thoughts of sexual misconduct? Fourth, devout Buddhists are not to be selfish. If we are not selfish, then we do not tell lies. We tell lies because they are afraid of losing personal benefits. Overcome by selfishness, we cheat people and tell lies, hoping to hide our true face from others. Fifth, devout Buddhists are not to seek for personal benefits. If we do not seek for personal benefits, we will have opportunities to develop our unselfishness. Sixth, devout Buddhists are not to drink intoxicated drinks. If we do not drink intoxicated drinks, we will not violate the precept against taking intoxicants. Why do people take intoxicants? It is because they want to delight their bodies and minds. However, this temporary delight will mess up their bodies and confuse their mind in the long run. Once intoxicated, they will scold people and do as they please, and their lustful desires increase. During the time of the Buddha, the Buddha recommended five practical suggestions that would be beneficial to laypeople. 
First, harboring a good thought opposite to the encroaching one, e.g., loving kindness in the case of hatred. Second, reflecting upon possible evil consequences, e.g., anger sometimes results in murder. Third, simple neglect or becoming wholly inattentive to them. Four, tracing the cause which led to the arising of the unwholesome thoughts and thus forgetting them in the retrospective process. Fifth, direct physical force. Besides, the Buddha also taught. One should not wish to be repaid for good deeds. Doing good deeds with an intention of getting repayment will lead to greed for fame and fortune. However, in any society, gratitude is a precious virtue, and Buddhists should always remember the kindness and assistance others have given you. Even though the Buddha asked the giver not to wish to be repaid for good deeds, he always considered gratitude to be a great blessing, an extremely high quality to develop for every Buddhist. Besides, devout Buddhists should always cultivate both the body and the mind. Body cultivates but mind does not meaning, there are people who have the appearance of true cultivators by becoming a monk or nun, but their minds are not determined to find enlightenment, but instead they yearn for fame, notoriety, wealth, etc. just like everyone in the secular life. Thus, cultivating in this way is entirely contradictory to the Buddha's teachings, and one is better off remaining in the secular life and be a genuine lay Buddhist. Devout Buddhists should always have filial piety toward one's parents, means not only to avoid causing them pain, but also to strive to make them happy. To be filial, therefore, is to have loving kindness and compassion towards our parents, not necessarily to obey them in any circumstances. Filial piety also means to strive to guide our parents to tread on the virtuous way. The Buddha taught when one is filial towards one's parents, it is the same as one has compassion for all sentient beings. For in the uninterrupted cycle of birth and death, beings had been one's parents at some time in the past. Thus, the Buddha taught. Before joining the order, monks and nuns should bow down before their parents one last time in gratitude, and then never again. To be a good Buddhist, you should have an appropriate conduct of a real Buddhist. You should always conduct yourself according to the Buddha's teachings. To achieve these, you will not only become a noble man and attain happiness in this very life, but you will also be able to leave this world without fear, for you have committed no sins. Devout Buddhists should always remember that the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas always support us in our cultivation. They always promote the virtues of the followers, help them remove greed, hate and delusion, and protect them from ghosts and men who may maliciously try to interfere with their spiritual practices. They bestow material benefits. Since the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas are all merciful, it was natural and, in some ways, logical to assume that they should concern themselves with the ideal wishes of their adherents, protect their earthly fortunes, and ward off disasters. Avalokitesvara, for example, protects caravans from robbers sailors from shipwreck, criminals from execution. By his help women attain the children they wish. If one but thinks of Avalokitesvara, fire ceases to burn, swords fall to pieces, enemies become kind-hearted bonds are loosened, spells revert to where they came, beasts flee, and snakes lose their poison. However, this aspect of Buddhism is only used to help calm the mind of Buddhist beginners who encounter problems. The Buddhas and Bodhisattvas provide favorable conditions for the attainment of enlightenment and liberation for Buddhist followers. Finally, devout Buddhists should always look up the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and consider them as objects of desire to love for all Buddhist followers. In the Anguttara Nikaya Sutra, the Buddha commented on the four kinds of bliss a layman enjoy. The first happiness is the bliss of ownership. Herein a clansman has wealth acquired by energetic striving, amassed by strength of arm, won by sweat, and lawfully gotten. At this thought, bliss and satisfaction come to him. This is called the bliss of ownership. The second happiness is the bliss of possession of property. Herein a clansman by means of wealth acquired by energetic striving, both enjoys his wealth and does meritorious deeds. At this thought, bliss and satisfaction come to him. This is called the bliss of wealth. The third happiness is the bliss of deathlessness. Herein a clansman owes no debt, great or small, to anyone. At the thought, bliss and satisfaction come to him. This is called the bliss of deathlessness. The third happiness is the bliss of blamelessness. Herein the Aryan disciple is blessed with blameless action of body, blameless action of speech, blameless action of mind. At the thought, bliss and satisfaction come to him. This is called the bliss of blamelessness. According to the Sutra in 42 sections, chapter 37, the Buddha said. My disciples may be several thousands miles away from me, but if they remember and practice my precepts, they will certainly obtain the fruits of the way.
on the contrary, those who are by my side but do not follow my precepts, they may see me constantly, but in the end they will not attain the way. Also according to the Sutra in 42 sections, chapter 27, the Buddha said. Those who follow the way are like floating pieces of woods in the water flowing above the current, not touching either shore, and that are not picked up by people, not intercepted by ghosts or spirits, not caught in whirlpools, and that which do not rot. I guarantee that these pieces of wood will certainly reach the sea. I guarantee that students of the way who are not deluded by emotional desire nor bothered by myriad of devious things. But who are vigorous in their cultivation or development of the unconditioned will certainly attain the way. This is the end of this video. If you're enjoying and benefit from this video and want to see more awesome content like this, please consider hitting that subscribe button below. It's the best way to stay updated with all of our latest videos. And if you found this video beneficial, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and share it with your friends and family. Your support means the world to us, and it helps our channel grow. Thank you for being part of our incredible community. Together, we can make this channel even more fantastic. Stay tuned for more beneficial content coming your way. Thank you.